I always appreciate being after lunch because that means when you fall asleep, I can blame lunch instead of my, myself for that. Um, I want to just take a few minutes today and kind of share with you um, kind of an epiphany I had about a year ago in terms of how I test my students, in particular um, in my statistics, introductory statistics course. And so I kind of switched things up last fall and uh, last and then followed suit in the spring. And so I want to share with you kind of um, my thinking around what I did, what it is I tried, and then I'll share at the end with you some um, data and some student feedback on, on that. And my hope is, my goal, is that maybe you'll walk away thinking a little bit differently about how you use assessment. And I'm not advocating that you should do what I do. I don't think I've uh, got it completely um, foolproof at this point. But I hope that you can go away with some ideas as to how you might uh, modify or adapt what you're presently doing to uh, in, engage students and in, improve student learning. So just so that you kind of have some context about where I'm coming from, and so you can kind of see if this would work or not work in the environments that you're engaged. Um, what I'm doing is being done in my introductory statistics course. It's STATS 1045. And the course itself is a QL course um, that students pretty much have to take um, to graduate. It's an alternative for students who are uh, in the social sciences or arts, um, make, mostly those who are in non-mathematics and science-related fields. It's an alternative for them to, say, college algebra. Um, and so what we've done with this course um, is taken and put together the equivalent course with a, another introductory statistics section that we offer and then added in additional uh, algebra content to make the course accessible to students who have typically not had a whole lot of success in mathematics. Um, and these students then that I see are almost always anxious about mathematics and how they're going to do. Um, because I teach in a regional campus, most of my students, many of my students, I shouldn't say most, but many of my students are moms who are coming back to school, dads who are coming back to school after being away from school for a very long period of time. So on top of the fact that they have math anxiety, um, they also have anxiety about just being in a college environment at such an old age, in their opinion. And so um, I have a lot of students who are just taking the class because they have to. Um, it says here that about 30% of the course students take it as a prerequisite. On the books, it's not listed really as a prerequisite for any other courses. Um, but I have found that there are a lot of students who take this course because they're going to later take like a sociology statistics or a psychology statistics course. So that 30% kind of references people who were, even if it's not on the books as a prerequisite, they are kind of taking it to help them prepare for a later statistics course. So, so that you understand, I'm really dealing with people who hate what I do and hate the content and hope to just survive. Like that's their goal, most of them, to just survive. Um, so in the past, before last year, when I was approaching instruction and assessment, I would essentially say, okay, traditionally in a math class, you know, you cover so many units of material, you take a test on that material, then you cover so many more, you take a test on that material, then you cover maybe a little bit more and throw a final exam at everybody. And that's how I grew up, that's the kind of system I was exposed to, so it worked, that's, that's what I did. Um, and about a year ago, Oh, two years ago, I had an interesting experience with a, one particular student that made me start to rethink my assessment. And it just turned out that this student actually, she was a student in Salt Lake, and my parents live in that area, and she knew my mom. She lived in my mother's neighborhood and associated with my mom. And so my mom would say, oh, she's really worried about this class, and so on and so forth. And this student really struggled. And I don't know still today whether her struggle was primarily because she wasn't putting in enough effort or whether it was really just she would sit in an exam and just completely not have any clue what to do and, and just have so much anxiety that it prevented her from doing well. And so what I um, realized in light of her experience and probably I should have realized much sooner in my career is that this kind of an exam structure creates a lot of extra anxiety for students. 
um, because there's so much material to cover and they have to remember so many things, um, there's just a lot of anxiety associated with testing in general. So this com compounds that. The other thing, and this was particularly true in her case, when a student performed poorly on the first assessment, that pretty much meant they'd given up. And I would get emails over the last week, the week after the first test where they would say, I failed the first test, so is there really any point to me keep coming to class? Should I keep trying? Um, and I always was baffled by that because I thought, sure, keep trying. Like, we're only five weeks into the semester, four weeks into the semester. You've got a whole lot of time still. Why would you give up? But it occurred to me that they don't like math, so why would they continue to do or to try to succeed at something that they've had feedback on that they're failing to, to perform well at. And <clears throat> that also, uh, I noticed, meant that some students just stopped attending, or they would drop the course, or they would just not drop the course but still not come, right? Which I thought is a complete waste of your money, but I can't stop that. Um, and then the thing that really kept hitting me is the only thing that they're learning when they do poorly on an exam in this traditional structure is that I really am not good at mathematics. And it's reinforcing that mentality that I can't do this. It's not teaching them anything. And I took for granted, because school was easy for me, I took for granted that everybody just did what I did and that when they got an exam or a test or an assignment or anything back, they would compare it with an answer key or look over the things that they did wrong and try to understand why they missed what they missed and, and try to improve on their uh, performance. Um, and I realized, I taught high school before coming to Utah State, and I realized that they don't. They just look at it to see what the score was, and that was their, their only goal, is to, did I do poorly or did I not? So I, I'm working on my PhD in Teal department, and doing a lot of stuff around Carol Dweck's work with mindset and um, watched a recorded TED talk or video where she's being interviewed by um, the, the guy that does um, Khan Academy. And she makes this statement, and, and I've put the link there if you're interested that you can go watch the video. It's like a 10 or 15 minute video, but um, she makes this statement that if you're getting a grade, a failing grade, then you just figure you're done. There's, there's nowhere for me to go. There's no improvement that can be made. But if you get a grade of not yet, then it encourages you to continue to move forward and continue to try to, to reach that yet. And so with all of this kind of swarming around in my mind, I stop to think about what is it do I want from assessment? And if you haven't like consciously thought about that, because I taught for a lot of years without really thinking deeply about what do I want tests to do for me, um, I encourage you to do that because it was insightful for me to think about this. The first thing I decided that I wanted from assessment is I wanted, of course, to know what did they get, what didn't they get, right? That's probably pretty obvious. But I also wanted students to feel empowered, not judged. I wanted them to get a score back and kind of think, okay, what does this propel me to do next, not this is some sort of judgment on my ability. I want um, for students to not have to be anxious about me telling them what they do or don't know yet and them continuing to work towards those goals. And most importantly, I wanted them to have the experiences that I thought were automatic, and that is learning doesn't stop once the test is over. Right? I remember being an undergraduate myself and I took a math test and, and I did terrible. Like it was the first time in my life that I like really did terrible on a math test. So it was kind of a culture shock to me. And I remember being so disappointed that we went to class the next day and the professor was going through some things on the test. And suddenly I like went, oh, right? And in that moment, that's when I learned how to learn. And I realized, hey, this is awesome. Like it's okay that I did terrible because I know it now and I could do it if I was asked to do it again. And so I wanted that experience, or I want that experience for my students. So what I did in response to all of these things and how I have been assessing for the last two semesters in this course and plan to roll out this semester is that instead of giving two exams and then a final, I'm testing nine times throughout the semester, 
You might call it a quiz. People would maybe think of it more as a quiz. But these, these assessments generally come every week to two weeks, depending on the material. So I sit down and I say, OK, there are, there are basically 10 chunks or 10 units of information in this course that, are, that I think are important. And I'm only able to test them on nine, because we run out of time at the end of the semester on the 10th one. So the 10th one, I assess on the final. But it's usually one of the easier topics, so it's not hard. And what I do is, so after the first week or so of course, of the course, they will be given a first assessment. And the first assessment has one question. Now, that question probably has A, B, C, D parts to it that are all kind of tied into it. That's easy for me to do because statistics is very much a calculate it. What does it mean? You know, there's different things I can ask about the same data, for example. So I, I give them this one question. They get a score back. I, I grade it not on, I just grade it kind of on a rubric. So zero if they don't do it, or there's like little evidence that I have any clue as to what they know or don't know. Um, they get one point if there are, they've made a, an attempt at something, but it's way out in left field. They get a two if they have a wrong answer, and they have a wrong answer because there's some major either conceptual errors that they're making or there's some major mathematical mistakes that they've made. A three if they've made only minor errors and have an incorrect answer, and then four if everything's there. Or they can get a four with an incorrect answer if the only reason for the incorrect answer is they had faulty data from before. So if they had the wrong answer in part B, I don't penalize them for that in part C, for example. <clears throat> so they take that one test, they get a score back on that, and then it's the power of, yeah, it's, this isn't final, right? If you don't like this score, then you're going to have another opportunity to see this material again. Because after we've covered the next topic and you go in to take assessment two, now there will be two questions. The first question will assess new material, the stuff we just talked about. And again, it will be one question with multiple parts. And then there will be a second question that reassesses the topics from week one. And then in week three, we do that again, right? We take a new, then we have three questions. Now, you might think, okay, so by the end, they're taking like a 10 question test. But it really just cycles kind of like that, right? So in week one, they see week one material three times, see week two, three, four, five, six. They see each set of topics or each concept, set of concepts, roughly three times, with the exception of the last couple, because again, I just run into the end of the semester, and so they don't have time to take those assessments three times. Now, when I say they see those topics, it's not just re-give them the same question. It's not even sometimes the same um, formatting of the question. In other words, it's the same content. I still want to know whether you know these ideas about observational studies versus experiments and the keys that are contained or the differences between them. But I may not ask you all of the exact same questions the second time around. So just because you can draw a histogram the second time doesn't mean that next time you're going to have to draw a histogram. You might have to look at a histogram and interpret information that's provided in a visual instead of creating the visual. So the content overlaps, but the, the questions are scaffolded so that they're not just repeats. It's not just go back, memorize how to do it, and come back and give the right answer the next time. So in analyzing, and granted, I only have two semesters worth of data, so this isn't a huge uh, sample size by any means, 169. It's sufficient, but it's not, um, I mean, I, I would be more comfortable knowing how more people feel about it. But what you see in this blue line is this is the percentage of students who kept their, their first attempt at this content. So this 46.7 means 46%, 47% of the students, whatever score they got the first time, that's the score they ended up keeping. That's why these last two are so high, because they don't get a second attempt on this one, and they, don't get a, they get a second but not a third attempt on this one. So, and then the orange line is how many kept their second attempt, and the, red, or the green is how many people keep, what percentage are keeping their third attempt at the material. Now, ideally, right, you would look at this, and first I did, and I thought, well, gosh, there's a pretty high percentage of them who are keeping their first test, so maybe I don't need to do this. 
But I'm looking down here and thinking, these are the kids who need it, right? These are, the, I call them kids because I taught in high school for a long time, but most of my students are no longer kids. So but th these are the folks that needed it, right? These are the kids that are students that are most anxious about what's going on, and that by the time they've had three attempts to sort of say, here's what I know, there's some improvement in what they are doing. But then I was really curious because I thought, okay, so there's a high percentage of them who are keeping their first test. But I give them the option. I make the second and third questions optional. So when they go in, they have to take the first question. Everybody does. If they don't take the first one, they don't get a chance to recover credit on the second and the third one. Because I don't want them dragging their feet to say, I'm not going to study, I'm not going to study, I'm not going to study, and then go in on the third attempt. So I force them to, to, to try something on the first attempt. Um, but I also tell them, you should, theoretically, do all the problems on every test because then you're getting that you know, constant review of everything that we've talked about. And if by the time week four has passed, you can't remember what we did in week one, then you're going to have a hard time when we get to the final and I'm reassessing some of the things from week one. So this was a way for me to build in a spiral review as well. And I, I think as the semester progresses, fewer and fewer of them take advantage of all three options. I'm not yet convinced that that's because they don't value the system because the later topics tend to be a little bit less, um, they're a little bit more, uh, I don't want to say easier, but they're a little easier for students to progress through and, and grasp quite naturally the first time. They don't, the early topics that we cover in this class, there's a lot of ambiguity in some of those things and the later ones there's less ambiguity. So they have the option, and there were so many students who were not taking full advantage of doing all three options that the next thing I decided I wanted to look at was, okay, 46% kept their first score, but 48% passed on their first score. So, and when I say passed, I'm using 75% as that mark because like I said, the students I see are just taking it to get a C. I'd say probably 60% of my students, if they get a C, they're fine. That's all they want. That's their big goal is just to get out of the class. So for me, I'm looking at this blue line and I'm saying, okay, so on the second assessment, only 59% of them just took whatever they got on the first score, but only 41 of them actually met 75% on that score. So to me, anytime this green line is below the blue line, it says to me, that's a problem, right? Because obviously there's only 40% who passed on the second attempt, but they didn't take advantage of that opportunity to, to, to try again or to do uh, more later. And then I looked at, okay, but I don't want to focus on just this first attempt because the whole point of this is what does it do over time for the folks who take advantage of it? So again, the orange line is, is the, again, those people who passed the first time, and the green line is the ones who passed on their first attempt. So the orange one is at some point before they were done, they passed that assessment. They met the 75% mark on that assessment. And so 68% of the students in the course at some point in time got to that 75% level, um, even though only 48% of them did it on the first attempt. So this was encouraging to me because I thought if you look at this, and again, the, the back numbers here are the same because there is only one attempt there. But if you look at it, it's an indication that at some point, everybody's kind of catching up to the point where they can at least get to that passing mark which I realize maybe, in, in my mind, is a low bar. I'd really rather that they were up around 80 or 85 percent. Um, and I haven't looked at that data carefully, but um, in their minds, this would be success, right? Which I use that term fairly loosely. Is there any questions on these pictures or graphs or? Yeah. So the question is, do I feel like um, overall did the students do better um, in the end 
with this new structure than they did in the beginning? Was there more students at the end of the course who had higher grades and better passing and more passing than under the old structure? Or is it simply a measure of, yeah, more of them got to that level, but it doesn't really change the end outcome? Is that summarizing? Um, I don't, I haven't looked at specifically those numbers. Anecdotally, I would say, I have it, what I have noticed is I don't have as many students who drop after a first exam. I'm not getting a bunch of, okay, now I went from 50 students to 40 students because 10 people have given up. So I don't have as many dropping, and I can carry, and I don't have as many who don't quite make it through the semester. Nearly everybody, there's always one or two stragglers who don't, but nearly everybody at least completes the coursework. That's one thing I've noticed. But I, ha I, I would say I can't, there's not been a significant difference or noticeable difference in the number of passing grades or Bs or As compared to before. Which to me says it's not hurting. So it's maybe not, but it's not maybe as effective as in that regard as I would, as I would like. I just have these, so the question is, do I have other midterms or, or just these? I just do these. And then they take a final. And the final they take is the same final that I would have created in the old system as well. And I encourage, that's why I encourage them, every time you're taking an assessment, do all the problems. Because guess what? At the end of the semester, you have a final exam practice set of problems. Like you, what, these are the things I've assessed all semester. You have them because I scan their, their, their regular assessments and send them back to them. You have them, so when you say, how can I prepare for the final, there you go. Right? If you haven't done those problems yet, go do them. If you've already done them, compare, right? Compare the first attempt to the second attempt to the third attempt. What mistakes were you making? What things did you not do the right the first time that you fixed the second time? And then, you know, what kinds of uh, patterns are you seeing? And it encourages students to kind of do that on their own instead of me saying, well, go and do 65 problems from, you know, this worksheet, and which I still give them some of that, but. So the so question is, what's the structure? How, does, how, how, how hardcore are these tests that I'm giving them? And the way I set it up is all of these tests together are 45% of their grade. So that's about 5%. Each, each one is about 5% of their grade. And the final is 30% of their grade. And um, they take all of the tests in their own respective testing centers. I'm very upfront about that at the very beginning that if you are living on the reservation and you need to be taking these tests in Blanding and that's a three-hour drive for you, then we need to figure out a way for you to, to make that happen. Um, and most of them, um, I haven't had a whole lot of people complain about that because they know up front that that's what's going to be expected. Some would prefer to have those assessments in Canvas, but the, the structure of the course is just I can't do that. I can't have them do a statistics problem in Canvas necessarily. So I, I make them go to the testing centers. Again, it's about every, once every week or every other week. And they do that. Um, a lot of them will just do it like after class, right? These are broadcast classes. So they'll come to class. And after class, they'll just go take the test. Because they're just one question, it's not like a three-hour test commitment, right? It's like you're in and out within a half an hour usually. And, and so again, there's less anxiety attached to I have to go and be in a seat for an hour and a half to do this test. Did that answer your question? I still have homework. They're still doing regular assignments. I think I have that as 10% of their grade or 15. And I also have them do a course project, which is another level of accountability for me. The course project has three parts that are spaced at particular points in the class where they gather their own data and do analyses on that data. and. That is just a one-time, you turn it in and, and 
No other questions. Well, Chair, I understand so they, they keep the scores for each one of these sets. They don't drop in there. Thank you. No. So I should have been, I, that was an obvious point I should have made. Um, so what do I do with the first, second, third attempts? They get to keep whichever one is the best attempt. So again, low stakes, right? If they come in on the first attempt and they get 100%, they can still take the second attempt. And if they don't get 100%, I'm not going to penalize them for that, right? I'm interested in, did you learn this at some point? Not, can you on this day and this time prove to me that you know it? Um, and so if they take the first one and it's really, really low, they can come in, do a little better, come in and do a little better, right? And the highest one is all that matters. But if they come in and do really, really high, they can still come in and keep trying because it helps. And I have several students who will do that, not because they need to, but because it helps them to make sure that they still know what they thought they knew two weeks ago. So what kind of accountability is there in terms of um, a student goes to the testing center on Monday, their buddy's going to go in on Wednesday. How do I keep the buddy on Monday from telling the buddy on Wednesday what's going on? Um, I don't put different forms in the testing center. I put one form. They don't get their test back until after all the tests are integrated, of course. But I also make them sign on the on a front page. that uh, there, I have a whole front page that's just, I understand that if I share any portion of this with any other student, that's considered cheating. And if, you know, then you'll be under the academic probation kinds of things that happen if that happens. I don't know that I have that risk as much as some of the others of you may have because my students are generally spread out all over the state. And so there's fairly low risk, for example, that a student in Price is going to call up a student in Moab and say, here's what was on the test. They, they don't usually, um, they're so spread out that that's, low risk. I can't promise that it hasn't ever happened, but I think that there's some individual accountability that I leave up to them for that. I mean, if they want to cheat, they're going to find a way to do it anyway. No, the ninth assessment assesses the very last content in the course, uh, or the next to last. So, um, and then there's one, so there are 10 units in the course. So this is an assessment of the ninth unit after that, we still cover one more unit, and the final exam then covers all of this with a primary emphasis on these later ones that they only tested the one time on. Right, there's not a significant difference between how, I mean, it's not hurting anybody, but it's not helping, like, dramatically anybody either. So it, and I don't have evidence to say, wow, if everybody does this, it will solve all of the problems in assessment. But I don't have any evidence that says this is hurting people if you do it. Yeah, the, the fact that the, they're sticking with the course I mean, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating when I say under the old structure, I'd give the first assessment and there would be several students, a dozen, that just disappeared, either formally disappeared or in, in mental, mentally. They, they stopped coming, they, didn't, they came but were only filling up a seat, really. They weren't really trying. Um, and that, I have noticed, is not as, as big an issue. I do, want, I do have this data. Now, this is kind of... In the old structure, so this, this represents two semesters, a fall semester last year and spring semester of this year. Um, and this is the similar data from the academic year before. Um, I can't pinpoint which of these exams correlate to which of these because I've also switched the order in, in which I do a couple of things and so on. Um, so there's one probability I use. Here I did it first thing. Here I do it later. So, um, but only 44% pass, I mean, that's at 75% mark again. Under the old structure, I only had 44% of my students that reached that 75% threshold on the first exam, which would have been roughly these first four assessments. And that number is never below 50 in this new structure. 
So, and, and similarly, the, down here it's not quite as dramatic because again, as the, the, it, arguably, <laughs> the hardest stuff in my class is really the first stuff. And then we get, because this is where they have to think. <laughs> Out here they can just do calculations and, and you know, plug it into a formula and get an answer and they're much more comfortable with that kind of an environment. But here's where they really have to think. And so that first exam, and that was another reason why I did this because so many students would take that first exam and go, oh, there's no hope, and I'm thinking, oh, it gets better. Just hang in, the course is not gonna be like this the whole time. Um, just a couple of things so that you can kind of see from, from student standpoint what students say. Um, I've given both semesters a uh, survey just at the end as to what they thought. And nearly 65% of them claim that at most of the time or they're always utilizing this opportunity. Now that doesn't necessarily mean they always need it. They may still score really high on the first attempt, but they are at least looking at um, multiple attempts. And sometimes they'll do it on one test, but not on another. It just depends. Um, as far as reducing anxiety, which was a major goal of mine, this is for me huge. In an introductory class filled with people who hate the topic and who just want out the minute they walk in, to say that 57% of them feel less anxious about what it is they're doing is to me a, a small success as well. And this was, remember, one of my goals for assessment is do they learn what they're supposed to learn? And this is suggesting that most of them say, yeah. And there's some comments to that effect as well. Um, I, I knew that if I did really bad on the assessment that I could study more and try again to do better. Made me, feel, made me feel like the instructor wanted us to learn the material rather than meeting quotas for teaching concepts. I thought, well, that's, that's exactly what I'm trying to do, causing me to study the material more. I mean, these are all kinds of uh, bullet points that said to me, even though I can't say that, you know, I could only have a 60% pass rate before and now I have a 90% pass rate, even though I can't point to that information, to me, the folks who use this system the way it's intended to be used are benefiting, and that's all I can ask, because I can't ask for every student to take full advantage of what I do. But if they do, then the, the foundation is there for them to be successful. So I don't know if anybody has any more questions or things that, it is a ton of work on my part to grade, because I'm grading tests like every other week. But in my opinion, I would either spend that time grading 10 problems twice a semester, or I'm spending the same amount of time grading one problem every couple of weeks. And so to me, the time commitment isn't any different. It's just spread out over the whole semester as opposed to, well, for this week, I'm pretty much grading exams all week. I appreciate, I appreciate that comment that, that students will probably benefit down. I may not see the benefit, me personally, but and I, do, I have noticed a lot more of them on that at the end on the course evaluations who say to that point, right? I feel like I really know what I'm doing. I didn't just walk through a class and get a grade. So whether they do or not, I can't for sure verify, but I, I hope that's the case. Um, I'm going to say there's a portion of those who didn't take advantage because they did well. The, they, they're, the, they're the kids who are just going to do well the first time, so they don't need to waste the time this, the next time. But there's a portion of them in there that just, their anxiety is so great coming in that I don't know how to help them. They, they can't overcome that hurdle. So I, think, I don't know what the, that would break down, but of that 40% who are not using it, some of them don't need it and others of them, they're just so deflated they, they can't pull out of that. But 
I'll hang around if anybody has any other questions. Um, thanks.